Hello, and welcome to the Black Ponder. I'm Neil Trotter. Today, we're going to be talking about one of the most controversial works in philosophy, and that's Immanuel Kant's The Groundwork of the Metaphysic of Morals. Now, why do I say this is one of the most controversial works in philosophy? At least I think so. Well, I say that because a lot of people take issue with this text or just with Kant in general. I notice three things when I talk about philosophy with other people who like philosophy or just in, on the internet in general. Number one is that a lot of people think that Immanuel Kant is really boring, right? He's very long-winded. He goes on and on and on. He takes forever to make his point. He uses unnecessary, complicated terminology. Number two, several people feel that Immanuel Kant is pretty redundant. When he makes a point, he kind of repeats that point over and over and over again and it makes his text kind of unnecessarily long. And on top of that, some people think that other philosophers around Kant's time or like a little before or a little after, they've said the same ideas that Kant says, but they do it in a more eloquent way or in a more concise way or just in a better way. <laughs> so several people feel that there are notable philosophers out there who make Kant kind of obsolete or irrelevant or at least redundant. Then you got number three, which are people who feel that Immanuel Kant or his philosophy at least is evil, right? It's the, the root cause of a lot of ideologies that are like horrifying like Nazism or the concepts Immanuel Kant brings up were the seed that started fascism and the start of World War I and even World War II. I know that's an extreme point of view, but there's quite a notable people who out there who believe that. It's kind of interesting though, that you have these two extremes, one who feels that Immanuel Kant is just too boring, and then another extreme that feels Immanuel Kant is extremely evil. <laughs> I don't believe any one of those things, really, I'm gonna be honest with you. Let's talk about the moral philosophy of Immanuel Kant. Let's talk, let's break that down. It's actually pretty straightforward. Basically what Immanuel Kant is saying is that an action is moral or ethical when it serves what Kant calls the universal law. And the universal law is a set of principles, an unintelligible set of principles actually, that's about doing good or doing what's best for all people. But not just for all people, for everyone, for everybody, for everything. What's moral is having a duty for the betterment of all. A duty toward universal benefit. Your action shouldn't be motivated toward the betterment of just one person or one individual or even a single group of individuals or a, a certain aspect of society or something like that. No, for your action to be truly moral, to be truly ethical, they must be of service toward the betterment of all. Your intention when you act is to help everybody, everything. That's when your action is moral. This is what Khan is saying. Now the obvious question is, well, how does one know what's best for all? That's a very hard thing to determine. Lots of people have different opinions about what's best for everybody, and we have huge debates and even wars about them, right? How do we determine this? Well, let me read you this quote from the book. In theoretical judgments, when ordinary reason ventures to depart from the laws of experience and the perceptions of sense, it falls into sheer unintelligibility and self-contradiction, or at least into a chaos of uncertainty, obscurity, and vacillation. On the practical side, however, the power of judgment first begins to show what advantages it has in itself when the ordinary mind excludes all sensuous motives from its practical laws. So basically what Khan is saying is that the reason why people have different ideas about what's best for everybody is that we're limited to our points of view, our perspectives. And that's based on our perceptions. Not only the five basic senses, sight, touch, taste, hearing, all those, but also our circumstances, how we're born, how we're raised, the economic circumstances, the political climate of where we're from. All these things can lock us into a set of morals that can be different from somebody who grew up with 
different kinds of senses, different kinds of circumstances, who don't perceive the world in the same way that other people do because of the economics of where they're from or the political climate or the basic biology or psychology that they were born with. It's our sense perception, our experiences that causes conflict, a moral clash. And how we deal with that is that we use philosophy as a tool to rise above our individual sense perceptions, our individual experience, to have a dialectic a discussion, a critique, an analysis with different people who are from different circumstances. Thus, ordinary reason, when cultivated in its practical use, gives rise insensibly to a dialectic which constrains it to seek help in philosophy, just as happens in its theoretical use, and consequently, in the first case, as little as in the second, will it anywhere else than in a full critique of our reason be able to find peace. We talk to these people in a civilized manner using reason, using logic, and we recognize that we're from different points of views and different circumstances and different perspectives, and we address those issues. Okay, what I think is right, you think is wrong. Why is it that we think this way? Let me share with you my experience, you share me yours, we'll take that into consideration We'll consider also logic and reason. We'll have a philosophical discussion about it. And in that way we can be like, okay, I need to consider your point of view, your perspective, and you consider mine. And together we can form a universal law. So we hear those two arguments, right? Again, we hear that argument, classic argument. Well, who really knows what's right for everybody and what's wrong for everybody? Is there such thing? You know, some people take it so far as to say, you know, morality is, it doesn't even exist because there is no such thing as what's best for every single person. There's only what's best for you. Philosophers like Nietzsche say things like that. And then the other argument is, yeah, morality, it comes from your specific point of view. It's rooted in that. Somebody who was raised in the Midwestern states of America is not gonna have the same moral base as somebody who grew up in a small island in Indonesia. Those are two separate ways of living, two separate circumstances. You can't expect somebody to share the same moral base when they have such ex extremely different circumstances. This is the argument, right? That a lot, a classic argument that you hear a lot. And from what I take from Immanuel Kant's uh, text is that Immanuel Kant will be the first to admit, yeah, you have a point. No one really truly knows, using any kind of logic or reason, what's right for everybody. There's no way you could really do that. And Emmanuel Kant would also say, yeah, uh, we are limited to our senses and our perceptions and our experiences. That's a huge part of what determines our understanding of the world. And it's going to be different for different people. Kant will be full on full board with that. But Kant's argument is like, okay, Let's be aware of that. And let's not just stop there. Just say, oh, well, the hell with morality then. No, let's not be lazy about this. Let put, let's put some effort into this, right? There is a such thing as morality. Don't cop out. We have this tool, it's called philosophy, and we can use it as a mediator to help us at least come to a consensus of a universal moral law. Let me read you this quote. It is here that philosophy is seen in actual fact to be placed in a precarious position, which is supposed to be firm, although neither in heaven nor on earth is there anything from which it depends or on which it is based. It is here that she has to show her purity as the authoress of her own laws, not as the mouthpiece of laws whispered to her by some implanted sense or by who knows what tutelary nature of all of which laws together, though they may always be better than nothing, can never furnish us with, the, with principles dictated by reason. These principles must have an origin entirely and completely a priori, and must at the same time derive from this their sovereign authority, that they expect nothing from the inclinations of man, but everything from the supremacy of the law and from the reverence due to it or in default of this condemned man to self-contempt and inward abhorrence. So the role of philosophy 
is to acknowledge that morality is rooted beyond sense perception. It transcends that. It's to come to that realization and it's to understand that that the only way we're, we interact with the world, with reality, is via our senses and our experiences, although that's not where morality is from. This is what Khan is saying. So a huge part of philosophy is coming to terms with that realization and then from that base creating a universal law of morality. Hence, everything that is empirical is as a contribution to the principle of morality not only wholly unsuitable for the purpose but is even highly injurious to the purity of morals for in morals the proper worth of an absolutely good will a worth elevated above all price lies precisely in this that the principles of action is free from all influence by contingent grounds the only kind that experience can supply people have different ideas of what's right and what's wrong and they conflict with one another because people are basing morality only off of their sense perception. True morality is not rooted in that. Tr true reality is beyond what we can perceive. So when we only rely on experience to develop our morality, we get into conflicts with others. And that's when morality falls apart. This is what Khan is saying. So where do we go from here? We can't just come to this realization and then come to and play this victim role or just give up, right? That's why I like Kant, because he doesn't give up. Oh well, we're just locked into our experiences and our senses. And what I think is what's right and what's wrong is different from a lot of other people's idea of what of what is right and what is wrong. And we're never gonna agree, so just the hell with it. You know, I'm just gonna do my thing, they're gonna do their thing, and if we come into problems, then we're gonna come into problems, I'm gonna knock that guy out or something, or something violent is gonna happen. And people tend to develop some sort of the hell with it type of attitude, but Khan is like, no, you need to be stronger than that. That's why philosophy is here. There is a tool, there is a method for us to come to a consensus, a moral consensus, and still do well for everybody. Even though we really can't come with a, a solid idea of what is ethical or what is moral, just based off of our experiences and our senses, even though that's impossible. Morality still exists, and it still exists on a universal level. Let me read you this quote. Man is not a thing, not something to be used merely as a means. He must always in all actions be regarded as an end in himself. That's very important. Oftentimes we have this idea like that we need to fight for concepts. We have to act on the interests of freedom, of virtue, of justice, of values. Whether it be American values or values of free enterprise or what have you. All these different values. But we can't fall into this trap of just serving concepts and values we have to remember that in the end what's important is people we shouldn't act in the interest of values we should act in the interest of people because that's the point right people aren't means to achieve concepts no it's the concepts that are means to achieve people people is the end goal of morality not the moral values themselves a violator of the rights of man intends to use the person of others merely as a means without taking into consideration that, as rational beings, they ought always at the same time to be rated as ends. That is, only as beings who must themselves be able to share in the end of the very same action. We are the good. We are the end result of our actions. People are the end result of what we do. This is how we should think. Kant argues. Our actions should serve other people because people should be the end result of morality. Humanity as an end in itself. This is the idea Kant proposes. For the ends of a subject who is an end in himself must, if this conception is to have its full effect in me, be also as far as possible my ends. So as we do well for other people, we also do well for ourselves. Because we're thinking in terms of the universal level. What helps me, helps you too. And if that's not the case, something's wrong. The idea of the will of every rational being as a will which makes universal law, 
By this principle, all maxims are repudiated, which cannot accord with the will's own enactment of universal law. The will is therefore not merely subject to the law, but is so subject that it must be considered as also making the law for itself and precisely on this account as first of all subject to the law of which it can regard itself as the author. So that's another important point. Kant argues that as we do well for everyone, those actions themselves become the moral law. So we create our own morality. That classic argument, well, who knows what's right and what's wrong for everybody? Nobody. But it's about intention. It's about duty. When we try to do what's best for everyone, that action in and of itself is the morality. That is what's best for everyone. What's best for everyone is your intention to do what's best for everyone. It's the duty itself. Who knows what's right and what's wrong? Well, let's try and figure it out together. And us figuring it out together, that is what's right. That is what's moral. For rational beings, all stand under the law that each of them should treat himself and all others, never merely as a means, but always at the same time as an end in himself. But by so doing, there arises a systematic union of rational beings under common objective laws, that is, a kingdom. Since these laws are directed precisely to the relation of such beings to one another as ends and means, this kingdom can be called a kingdom of ends, which admittedly only an ideal. You know the saying, the ends justify the means? Kind of saying, you have to think about it, that people, us, humanity, is the end and is also the means. We are the ends and we are the means. You as an individual is the end, and you as an individual is a mean. And everybody else is an end, and everybody else is a mean. We are our morality. We are the result of our morality, and our actions are the moral laws. Who knows what's really right and what's really wrong? That's a good question. Let's come together and have a philosophical discussion about it. Let's talk about our different experiences and the different ways we perceive the world and the different ways we were brought up and how we live. And together, we can come to a consensus and understanding of what's the best thing to do for you and what's the best thing to do for me. What's the best thing to do for all? This is Kant's morality. I don't know. I don't, I don't see this as evil at all. <laughs> like I don't see this as boring. I don't see this as redundant. I saw it as very insightful. I think it is a, a true classic of moral philosophy, of ethics. And I think you should check it out. Let's talk about it. Let's have a discussion about it. That's what the comments are below for. We're just trying to do well for each other. That's all we're trying to do, right? We can have different opinions about certain things. It's fine. Let's talk about it. Let's try and work it out. That's morality. So how do you feel about Immanuel Kant's ethics? Do you like it? Do you not like it? Do you agree? Do you disagree? Let's discuss. Because that's what morality is all about. Or maybe you don't feel that way. I don't know. But we can talk about it. In any case, you've been watching The Black Ponder. Tune in next time for more Philosophical Thoughts.